So this is the title of my presentation, and it's based on a PhD that I'm in the middle of doing at London Metropolitan University, and I'm from the Department of Architecture, so that very much shapes the work that I've done, even though it touches on a lot of other disciplines. So the title of the PhD is uh, The Depth Structure of a London High Street. And London is structured around a lot of major arterial routes, and mostly they're Roman routes, so they're thousands of years old. And my PhD is a study of this one, which is the A10, which is just the, the road name. Um, and it's specifically a case study of a little section of this arterial route at Tottenham. Tottenham might be familiar, I don't know if it was outside the UK, but the riots that sort of spread across mm -hmm. Europe a couple of summers ago, Tottenham was a bit of a focus of it in London. Um, and existing studies of the High Street are, there's many of them, but they tend to focus on High Streets as corridors of retail. And my argument is that actually high streets do a lot more than retail. They have lots of distinctive qualities and they're extremely important in structuring urban space. In the UK they tend to structure, in, in the USA it's the main street, it's exactly the same thing. Um, and they tend to structure towns, so the whole town will be structured around the main arterial retail street. Um, and in London, the whole city is really structured around this spider web of arterial streets. And they can absorb bad architecture. And that's a very important quality. The high street takes precedence over what populates it. They're also an enormous focus of business activities and really all kinds of life. Um, and in London particularly, outside the high street, it's just swathes of uh, residential streets. So to explore this complexity, um, I am employing a notion that I'm calling depth, and hence the title, The Depth Structure of the London High Street. And this paper is exploring what depth is and how the relationship between other parts of the city and the high street can be exposed through employing this notion. So I'm starting with a metaphor, depth is a metaphor, and it sets the scene for the idea of what I'm trying to expose. Um, it's a metaphor that means intensity, the depth of colour, or the depth of sound, and uh, profundity, depths of emotion, and the unknown or the unknowable, the, the depths. And it refers to things, this is a section through Tottenham High Street, that go in and under rather than up and over. So in literal terms, the depth of a high street is the physical depth, the interior of the blocks behind the facades, and the alleyways and the sheds and the post boxes and everything that's inside the first and second blocks behind the main street. Um, but these things don't exist in a vacuum. There's lots of other types of phenomena that are interwoven with them. So these photographs, for example, this signage and those signs represent and symbolise organisations which are housed in these places. So it's not just a physical arrangement, it's also non-physical things. Um, in the UK it's things like planning policy, so use classes which specify what you're allowed to do with different kinds of buildings, whether or not you can live in it or whether it has to be a shop or a business. Um, it's also the rhythms of human life, the networks of friendship. And this quote um, by Dalibor Vesely 
The identity of the French cafe is defined by the cafe's institutional nature, rooted in the habits, customs and rituals of French life. And these images are actually a cafe in a case study block on top of my street that I'll come to in a minute. And it's a Turkish cafe and they sell baklava and little Turkish coffee. The identity is formed in a long process during which the invisible aspects of culture and the way of life are embodied in the cafe's visual fabric. As if they were a language conveyed in written text, the visible text of the cafe reveals certain common, deep characteristics, such as its location, relation to the life of the street, transparency of enclosure, a certain degree of theatricality, the need to both see the life of the outside world and to be seen in it, an ambiguity of inside and outside, expressed not only in the transparency of enclosure, but also in the cafe's typical furniture, and so on. So, depth is, is the structure, physical structure, um, that's interwoven with the life of the high street, socially, historically, temporally, economically, politically, and it allows the individual living in the city to make a link between the observable physical phenomena that they're experiencing, like the high street or the French cafe, and all of the cultural um, layers of non-physical underlying structures. Um, it's a structure of communication linking topography with individual experience and life. And so I try to explore this through a case study of one block on Tottenham High Street. So here is Tottenham High Street, the dark line. And this is a block that is on either side of it. Um, and I use this block as a source of interview par participants. And I conducted observations, sat in cafes in this block, uh, walked about, made lots of drawings of it. Um, and I chose it because it contains many of the phenomena that the whole high street contains. Blocks tend to have very much a similar composition. So it's got shops and businesses, it's got few houses, um, and it's got civic buildings. So this is a Quaker meeting house. Tottenham is historically was a Quaker stronghold. Um, it's got 19th century um, yard, which contains lots of different sorts of business. Um, it's got a police station, uh, it's got a couple of schools, um, and lots of infrastructural buildings, particularly uh, a telephone exchange. So I can't remember the exact percentage, but it's a huge proportion of the population of London is employed within 200 metres of a high street, because that's where everything is, basically. So I won't go into all the findings of that block, because it's pretty complicated, um, but I will focus on the shops and businesses. And I'll particularly focus on this Morrison's Yard that I just mentioned. And it's here. Oh, my PDF has gone slightly askew. The uh, dotted line is actually supposed to be around here. But it's very old, Morrison's Yard. It's been there for 150 years. Um, and in the development of cities, you often see this, hence the fact that uh, the A10 is a Roman road. The road pattern outlives everything else because as you renew different parts of the city, you can't rebuild really over the road, and rerouting roads is very difficult. And similarly, this yard, even though a lot of the buildings in it are actually new, the yard itself is very old. So there's eight businesses in Morrison's Yard. Um, there's a catering company, which is in here. And this is a big um, block of offices and business premises, which has uh, another catering company, a bakery, 
um, and storage units for clothing and manufacturers, and there's a recording studio in there. Uh, and then along the front, fronting the high street, uh, there's the usual array of high street shops, a little bit of an optician, and there's that little cafe that I just showed you a photograph of, and uh, various other things, pharmacy. And to kind of explain the physical manifestation of death, this drawing is focusing on the catering company, which is called Shades Caterers. And by taking the lid and the walls of the business block, and Shades Caterers is an exploded axo. So you can see it's a very small little dinky shed that she occupies. The bottom left photograph, you can see it in comparison to a van. So it's probably like six times the size of, of a, a normal Ford transit van. Sharon, who runs Shades Caterers, has her office upstairs, and then downstairs is the middle photograph. Um, they've got a little kitchen, and they make uh, Caribbean food, uh, and they send it off around but to markets in the red catering van, uh, and they go out on weekends and sell their Caribbean food. But she also has a big client in Harrogate Council, so they do all their meetings and parties, and she has lived in Tottenham life so she has a big network of friends and acquaintances and a lot of their business comes from that she caters weddings and parties and the interesting quality about Shades Caterers is that although it has a very close proximity to the high street and it's access to the arterial route that is the high street and all the transport links is very important it doesn't need a high street frontage because it's not selling its wares directly in a shop. And that's compared with the Turkish Cafe, who primarily serve the mosque across the road. And they do need a high street location. They need a front door. You need to be able to see what they're selling. It's a big difference, but both of them absolutely rely on the presence of the high street. The reach of the shop or business depends on what they produce and their audience. And that's related to their physical location in relation to the high street. The other reason that something like Shades Caterers exists in this location is what I referred to previously, which is planning policy. These buildings are permitted to be occupied by certain kinds of businesses. The actual shape of the space that she occupies is based, it's, it's in existence. That typology of building is there for historical reasons close to the high street and she needs a particular number of meters to occupy and those sorts of size of buildings are in that location adjacent to the high street so it's a very complex and interwoven set of reasons that something really quite simple is in existence in this place and the kind of business that she has and who she is as well she's an ancient or a, a long-standing resident of Tottenham So to understand the, the high street, I'm arguing that you need to peel away all of these layers of complexity and reveal depth, both the physical and the non-physical. And I am arguing with my PhD that all of these different layers are brought together into one place through architecture and through physical manifestation of stuff. This is an alternative discourse to the very mainstream discourse in conversation about high streets, which is to talk about them as space. And space is used in planning and policy very much as a catch-all term. And it encompasses all the varied phenomena, which it's not an appropriate word, in my opinion. So a park and a market are both called public space but actually the qualitative difference between those is vast and the way that they're used and the political and planning underlying um, support structures are completely different. So, like the dictionary definition of space is a continuous area or expanse which is free
free, available, or unoccupied, which is absolutely not what any aspect of the high street is. So it's not space. And my alternative is to propose this depth and depth of place, which is situated, it's very specific to Tottenham, and it's layered. And this is how I feel we have it, something in common. According to um, Merla Ponty, the lived body gives access to the world, and its movement produces the space that you experience. And this process of dwelling is what turns space into place. And places can only be understood through their use. So to flatten everything into space is to make it very homogenous. And it makes it very easy to measure. And with high streets, the economic element of them is the focus of lots of poverty. But it misses what's actually very, very important about them, which is that they structure human lives. And the freedom of humanity, this is the Quaker Meeting House, um, and it's accessed by these stairs from the, the main street. And then you come into a, a first floor sort of open courtyard and it's been a Quaker meeting house on that site since 1750 or something, but this actual building was constructed in the 60s. And they, they have a burial ground to the back as well. So a tiny little burial ground, completely unexpected. So freedom is only meaningful if it's structured. And it's structured by architecture. And the structure allows people to make sense of the natural conditions. So you can be free, but only within the particular possibilities. Otherwise, it isn't, it isn't freedom, it's just chaos. And depth is the capacity of the city to accommodate a variety of settings. And each has its own character and direction. But the Quaker Meeting House has its own character and its own set of uses and its own direction. And it's in this way that the architecture and the city structures the fruitful coexistence of formal activities, civic institutions, and informal life, like conversations and moving from place to place and going to work. So in my exploration of existing literature, I found very few references specifically to do with high, high streets that have anything like this level of layering and complexity. And the accounts tend to flatten everything into something that can be measured. And it's a huge issue at the moment in the UK, the death of the high street. And it's all about money and it's about shops and it's about chain stores either taking over or not being enough chain stores. And no conversation about typologies that allow tiny churches to come into being or a little guy to set up a, you know, a, a little repair shop for a particular kind of bicycle, or little tiny bits of economic activity that contribute to something much more exciting and interesting and layered, and that is the metabolism of the city, a city like London. Um, and the language that's used in these kinds of um, reports absolutely reflects that. So it's not a shop, it's a retail unit, and it's not people, it's footfall, uh, and it's not empty shops, it's voids, uh, which is a very odd uh, way to describe it. So, in conclusion, I think the placelessness of the accepted and existing discourse on high streets neglects all of this complexity. And that's a, a terrible lacking because it's a constant presence in all of our lives, or whatever the equivalent of high street is in different places. I'm sure there's a parallels to be drawn. And I think one of the reasons that it's lacking is the absence of an academic approach from our architecture as a 
as a discipline rather than as a profession. So the way that I'm trying to study the urban as a concrete thing which can be interpreted hermeneutically as a text, like the French cafe, um, is absent from a lot of this kind of academic debate. And although this study is interpretive, interpretative primarily, um, I haven't been really constrained by any of the paradigms that I think tend to constrain um, methodologies used in different disciplines because architecture doesn't have its own established set of methodologies. Uh, and in one way that's a, a difficult thing for us, but in another way it makes us very free. And fundamentally everything is brought together in the concreteness of architecture. And so that is where everything should begin. Okay, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes. If uh, our speakers would like to have a seat at the front of the room and maybe field some questions.